Hey everybody, welcome to our weekly ecosystem office hours call. I am your host Jinx and we are joined as always by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to start things off this week with uh, our uh, protocol updates from, I think Fred, are you still running that or is Fred not here? No. Okay, so Olshansky, Shane, one of you two want to, uh... oh no, there's Fred. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Apologies. I thought I had more time to make my lunch. Oh, good. Go ahead. Um, give me one second to pull up the updates here from Protocol. All right. Okay. Um, we are uh, preparing a blog post for the announcement of Alpha Testnet 3. Um, mm -hmm. What is under development right now with protocol? Uh, Non-custodial staking is almost done. Revenue sharing is in review, and we are starting on the app stake transfer. Um, also a top priority is we're looking at the minimum stake per actor and just monitoring the performance intensity of the relay miner. So that is protocol. Beautiful. And then... Uh... From a gateway perspective, I saw the announcement yesterday regarding uh, uh, AppStake reconfig uh, in preparation for Gandalf. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we went down right away to one AppStake per chain, um, or each AppStake is only staked for one chain. Obviously, for some chains, we have multiples. Um, that is complete. We did a little snafu. Uh, it's a long, it took us a while. Uh, it's a very manual and intensive process. Um, thanks very much to Olshansky and Pascal, who's one of our team members who helped me uh, trudge through this. It was a big effort. <laughs> it took us a better part of two days, but it is done. And we are prepared for end stage Gandalf now. So we're really excited about that. And very excited for Gandalf to uh, come through. Um, in addition, uh, we are, uh, we've put out the comms about our new pricing that I've been promising. You can check that out. We're going to $2 per million. Um, this is not an ad, just letting people know that that's a change and that the hope is that we're going to attract more demand to the network with that low, low price. Um, other than that, that's pretty much the gateway. Um, on PATH, uh, we are still kind of undoing all the proprietary, or not proprietary, but the stuff that makes it hard to go open source with uh, our code base and preparing it for open source. We are still uh, aiming to have code in the repo that people can look at, play with, and use by the end of this month, but it will be a, in a very much pre-alpha state and will not have the full feature set. Um, so that's, that's our path update. That is all the Grove updates that I think I have today. Fantastic. And uh, I see Sasquatch in there. You guys have any gateway updates on your side? Uh, no, nothing, nothing to report this week. Okay, sounds good. Any other gateway updates uh, that y'all want to put out? Hey, uh, how's it going, Jing? Developer Dow. We're yeah. uh, working pretty hard to get the gateway up and running, and, you know, we're roughly three to four weeks away. Um, mostly waiting on my front-end guy to finish up with the design and integration for payments, but then developer DAO should be good to go. After that, it's realistically just testing the integration with the gateway, uh, benchmarks, allowing for people to retrieve uh, statistics that they're interested in, and uh, yeah, we'll be cleared to launch. Hell yeah, that's awesome, man. Looking forward to seeing y'all's go live. Hell yeah, very excited. And also, just uh, over the course of the conversation, uh, especially in, in mention uh, of Gandalf, uh, I want to stop and take a second to acknowledge the fact that uh, Shane has spent almost, I think, nine months in total bringing Gandalf to life. And it's something that uh, we broadly agree at this point is a critical aspect of uh, Pocket going forward. So kudos to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, it's actually uh, when I released the first proposal, I believe it was August. So I think we've uh, come full circle. Oh, wow. A year. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well done. Sometimes it really takes having that long view to, to get important things across the line. I don't have any planned speakers for today. So 
it's an open floor. Uh, whoever's got whatever topics, questions, things you want to demo or show off, or just questions in general, now's the time. Uh, yeah, one area that I think would be interesting to discuss, um, especially with uh, uh, the update from Fred regarding Gandalf. Uh, Fred, so could you expand a little bit on the uh, like reasoning, the rationale, the uh, kind of the strategy behind one uh, one stake uh, or one app stake per chain versus having an app stake that creates you know multiple sessions per chain. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because you know there are a lot of nodes uh, or gateways right now that uh, have multiple app stakes uh, or multiple chains per app stake, and I. I guess I don't I don't really know what the correlation is between Gandalf specifically and apps app stakes uh, per chain because max chains for nodes I don't believe is affected by app stakes. Am I am I correct or does max oh, chains? Oh, can stakes? add more color to this, but the short answer is that the number of stake slots available on nodes and app stakes are affected by this change. Right, right, because there's because basically how at least how I put it in in, in Gandalf is there are more app uh, uh, there are there's like right now there's basically fifteen times the amount of nodes there are uh, apps or uh, uh, session slots. So yeah, when you go down to one, it's it's now you only have as many sessions as you have uh, uh, nodes um, on the network. Uh, at least available, you know, session slots uh, per nodes on the network. So, anyways, yeah, I, I, I guess here, yeah, I, I guess just talking a little bit about that rationale because I think a lot of other providers are going to have to make that transition as well. So, what you're kind of thinking, what you've already researched, it'd be great to just hear a little bit about that. Yeah, I guess the question that you're asking is more about what that process looks like. Um, yeah, uh, at a very high level, what we did is we set aside a number of apps at the outset that were going to be our quote-unquote failover apps. So we still have eight apps that are staked for 15 chains, um, and we'll turn those off uh, or, you know, restake them for single chains when uh, we need to. But we established those as our failover apps, and we took the rest of our apps, and we looked at our traffic distribution internally, um, and then just use a proportions calculator, essentially, and some heuristics and gut knowledge of how things need to be to get, you know, good quality service on each chain, and then redistributed the number of stakes accordingly across each chain. So are, are nodes at some kind, or are gateways that are accessing multiple uh, multiple chains creating multiple sessions from one app stakes. Are they at some kind of disadvantage or is there some kind of issue they're going to run into when max chains is reduced? Yeah, when when max chains is reduced, and I, I'm not sure what the behavior exactly will be. I don't think we've looked at that, but I, my understanding is that those app stakes will no longer be able to process relays if they're staked for multiple chains. Because they're, those slots, it's the same behavior. A node with multiple stakes can't process relays. So maximum chains affects, I guess this is then where there needs to be clarity. Maximum chains affects both how many nodes uh, or how many chains a node can stake to and how many app stakes or how many no, chains. And how many chains an app to. can be staked for. Yes, that is correct. Oh, okay, so max change affects both. Yes, that's what that that's what I was trying to get across. So sorry for not being clear. Okay, got it. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's a process that um, every uh, every gateway is going to have to 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 go through. Um, I I did not know. Uh, I, I don't think that's ever been conveyed uh, from someone who's closer to the protocol uh, that. App maximum chains also affects app stakes. So this is the first time I feel like I'm I'm at least hearing. Um, so that's that's quite an important transition that every gateway is going to have to go through. Yes, sir.
Good to know. I hope all the gateways on the call are paying attention. Well, I mean, part of the challenge here is, I guess, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see because a lot of uh, gateways they only have a hundred or they only have ten app stakes, but they have like 10, they have ten app stakes that are well distributed for the chains that they want access to, um, and so. I guess, yeah, we'll have to coordinate because Grove, I believe, has 200 app stakes. So we'll have we to. We have 219. 219 app stakes. So, yeah, we'll have to see what that looks like then with, uh, with, with other gateways on trying to operate with only 10. Is there, hmm, this, this leads to some interesting questions then. Is there an ability to generate additional app stakes or is this a limitation we're going to hit on the network? From my understanding, uh, the issue is not the number of max or app stakes. I believe app stakes have been lost. That's where this comes down to, from my understanding. So there's only keys for the kind of existing app stakes that we have now. I could I could actually do a quick search right now to see how many app stakes we have unassigned because we do have uh, app stakes unassigned. So I'll, I'll quickly look that up. But from my understanding, there is, uh, yeah, the, the number isn't necessarily, the number of active app stakes or possible app stakes um, that we could use is is less than the actual app stakes on the network. Mm. But then the question still remains, can we generate additional app stakes? The answer is no. So one of, whenever we, with Shannon and scalability, whenever we say permissionless demand, that is kind of an overarching term that actually means that there is no technical scalable limitation to having unlimited relays and unlimited number of apps or gateways staking and sending proofs, claims, transactions onto the network. It's kind of one of the big reasons why we're doing an overhaul. Um, hypothetically, we could create more app stakes, but then we would need to modify a lot of other parameters on chain in order to make sure that there's not too much float, which, you know, increasing the block size, et cetera, et cetera. So it would require quite a bit of an investigation with uh, you know, a multivariable function with with a lot of investigation around the downstream effect of it. So that's why we're kind of just keeping it as is sustainable for now. Okay. So, so there is another 80 app stakes just so we're, we're operating with the right information. Uh, there are uh, 80 available app stakes that we have the keys that, yeah, uh, that the keys are available to. I don't really know the history behind the other keys or, or anything. I just know that these are the ones that we actually have keys for, that PNF has keys for at least. But that essentially means, if I'm understanding this correctly, that as gateways begin to stake new chains, we have yeah. roughly 80 left in the pipeline before Shannon needs to be able to resolve that. Yes, but if, but if I think the one challenge here is we might need to give existing gateways more app stakes, right? So if uh, if a gateway is wanting you know to serve ten chains, they'll only have one app stake. And I think for especially larger um, you know larger chains or any chain, uh, it might be a risk to only have one session uh, per app stake. So uh, so that's why you yeah you know and. I guess Grove, if they kind of know, like, if they're able to communicate what, how many app stakes they have per chain, that would, you know, that could help other gateways know how many app stakes they should potentially look for per chain. I'll tell you this, we would love to have at least five app stakes per chain, but we are operating many chains with just one. It's highly unlikely that you will have quality service with less than 100 available nodes to choose from for any given chain. 
can those can the app stakes be reallocated ever? I mean, yeah, you can you can I mean that's what PNF's been doing is giving you know giving app stakes to, to gateways and then they can be restaked on whatever chains. From my understanding at least. So they can be restaked as many times as you want. It's all about who controls the private key. Yeah, so once the private keys are out, then you know, unless it's the same entity, you probably would be at risk reallocating it to like, for example, another gateway. Yeah, but that's why we have transfer stake as well, which is what, as part of our process, we transferred stakes on all existing app stakes because we wanted to maintain the security of the private key. Um, I won't speculate too broadly, but if you notice, there was a little bit of a drop in relays over the last two days when we made new private keys, so. Fucking right. <laughs> Oh, they're such fucking liars. Okay. Is that question pretty well answered? We have any follow ons there? I'll take that as a yes. Well, in that case, Benedictus, go ahead and come off mute and uh, let us know what you're thinking about. Hi. Thanks. So, maybe to give you a bit of background so basically as porter started out um and we kind of took on our operations we realized that many of our like well, gateway clients and, and not you know consumers but like enterprises um want an sla now um especially when it comes to onboarding new chains that means that the gateway needs to make deals with node runners, uh, which can cause friction on both the gateway side and the node runner side. Um, coincidentally, we we're currently working on a bit of an R and D project uh, for an like bit bond platform, um, basically bringing together two parties um, and facilitating RFPs and the procurement of services and goods. Um, now, taking Porters and Pocket as um, a use case, we actually would love to hear input from node runners on like, using such a procurement platform in order to facilitate these kind of um, deals and, and make it more easily accessible and frictionless. So if there are any node runners out there, so I'm eyeing uh, towards a few of you um, who is willing to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes just either giving a rant or answering a couple of questions, very um, low engagement um, brief, then that would be really helpful in potentially influencing how you could come on to um, Portis um, or like generally using that platform. So that would be super helpful. So if any node runners are available for 15 to 20 minutes to speak about SLAs and coming on for servicing new chains um, through a platform rather than like bespoke processes, then this would be super helpful. Thanks. Anybody uh, have any thoughts or questions about that? I know, Fred, uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, the struggles with SLA. I'm darn proud of our SLAs. They're hard fought. Is the question of, like, would node runners be willing to sign SLAs? Is that the... Yeah, and over what kind of infrastructure? So basically, we're building a a software which could you know make that more automatic so let's say a new chain is coming on um we need like x nodes 
um, and to make that you know a little bit less or like less effort involved. Um, and basically, we want to collect requirements from 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 you from node runners um, on whether this system would actually help you or you would prefer talking about that on Discord. Do, do the SLAs are, are, are is that like two way? Like, would would there be any guarantee to the node runners of uh, like traffic volumes, uh, or just just curious? Uh, that would, for example, be a requirement that would be very insightful. Like things like that. Like really, just give us your rant and give us your wishes. That's basically all we're asking for. If if I may, um, I'm I'm DMing with Arthur on the side. He's saying, "Go off, King." Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is my strong opinion that gateways exist to provide an SLA on top of Pocket Network, and that node runners have no duty to provide SLAs other than to themselves because they are incentivized to earn, and so. That's why, again, we, we keep talking about PATH here. PATH Toolkit is designed to get you an SLA-backed gateway as quickly as possible. That's what we are targeting for you. Fred, how does that work with like a new chain where there, there might not be uh, like an existing community of uh, nodes or node rollers? Yeah, um, the cold start problem is very real. Uh, I, I I don't like tooting my own horn, but I'm I'm the new chains guy. I've done fifty seven now, so I, I know a little bit about it. Um, the cold start problem is real. Like their customers will always tell tall tales about how much about how much traffic they will do, and um, the reality is that you need to see in the current economic conditions, you know, with the current parameters, all that between one and a half to five million daily relays before a node runner or before you can reasonably look to be 100% on chain and not have to pay for infrastructure directly. Um, we've done RFPs in the past to procure node runners um, when we cold start a chain. Um, but that's, that's the honest truth. And what we typically look for too, just as a heuristic or a benchmark is that we want to see a couple hundred staked pocket nodes and a good array of domains that we see internally also staked for these chains. So um, that's that's kind of our litmus test. It's not a science, it is by, by and large an art. Um, and you can't predict which chains are gonna do well. Um, you know, we have Eigenlayer and Celestia. We turned off the Eigenlayer chains because we got literally 23 total relays. Um, and yeah, uh, same thing with Celestia. I mean, none of those chains are performing super well and they're like really popular and the, or at least hyped. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there's no predicting who's going to win and who's going to lose. Uh, so it, it is an art. I mean, would, would, would uh, two way SLAs help in your opinion of that? Like what bit Benedict is, and maybe I'm hearing something that you're not saying, but like if, uh, the. You know, the SLA was a two-way street where the chain was guaranteeing some level, not just hyping it like you're saying. Uh, would, would that make a difference? I can tell you from experience that nobody in this industry wants to sign a contract of any kind. <laughs> so, so that's maybe a, a good like piece of a good data point for Benedict, right? Like if you're wanting node runners to guarantee without getting a guarantee on the other side i think that might be tricky it's 100 percent tricky you have to make a bet like that's if i have to say one thing we've made bets along the way and some of them have worked and some of them haven't worked um like i said the the big ones in my mind that stand out as losers are like a lot or celestia has woefully underperformed uh but beacon chains have woefully underperformed um, you know, we've seen even like Op B and B has woefully underperformed what we would have expected. Um, and then you've got real winners like we didn't approach Optimism or Arbitrum, and we just took a bet, and they took off. And even you get some that are good for a time, and some that have died. Like Doge Chain, when it was really hot, was we had tons of relays. It was one of the best chains. 
and now it's long gone. Like we, we even delisted it from our uh, our uh, portal. So it's it's very hard, and it is a dynamic, living, breathing thing. Well, I, Vitaly and I disagreed on quite a few things, but one of the things that he said that that was just simply undeniable is that users of the protocol just do not give a fuck about the protocol. That they, they just want their shit to work. Are, are there any like uh, indicators that you've noticed, like um, that would potentially like allow you to like have like a, a due diligence type checklist that would sort of indicate whether or not a chain is likely to to do better than the average or unlikely? It's it's really hard because like you get into these multiple chicken for an egg scenarios. So most users. Like you can go on the, the first thing that I always look at when I'm looking at a chain, and this is my personal process, is I go and I look at the explorer. How many transactions are reasonably happening in a block? And then if we proxy that and we know the distribution of reads versus writes, where transactions are writes, and we know our ratio of read versus write, then we can say there are n total relays that come to that are even out there on this chain and then we say okay if our typical market share is like 10 percent or less is that going to meet that threshold of enough node runners enough domains enough balance there that we can provide a quality service and what we end up doing typically is like saying okay we'll bet on this and we go and we do an rfp with a node runner and we pay a node runner directly to make sure that they're going to be there and we leave it in place for a certain amount of time. And that obviously burns cash, which is not optimal. So on that, Fred, um, if I may, like the, the RFP, is that like a manual process or are you using like some, some sort of Google form of sorts? Yeah, we had a we had a Google form for a long time. And then just based on that, we also just reach out from relationships that we've built over time. All right. That's very helpful. And that's this has worked well, or are you basically looking for something or would you have been looking for something like more robust, more tailored, or did that just do the job? Um, I think it's been more than ample. I'm really happy with our node running community and uh, if we set up deals in the back uh, just to bootstrap, then they have always been successful. I have no complaints about any of our suppliers. These guys are top notch. Thanks. It feels like the real, like, um, where the rubber meets the road with the new chains is your ability to, like, accurately pick the ones that are likely to be successful. Uh, so, like, if you make an investment, it's kind of like making investments, right? If you're yep. uh, a, a, a VC, um, you can make more investments to spread your risk out, but you might increase your risk if uh, making more investments in bad companies is is the result of the bad bad bets. Um, so finding that right balance between uh, picking the right ones and having a specific number to cover risk do you feel like you guys are moving in the right direction to like be able to accurately say it's going to take this number of decent picks to get this number of uh what chains that are profitable um i think i can we can just look at the historical data here um of what chains are showing no relics on pocket scan and just say this is how many losers there are and then from there how many winners um i think it's it's it is probably it's less it's like 60-40 for success. Um, there are quite a few that have died along the way. And we've also gotten rugged and, you know, many other things have happened along the way. Is the return rate positive? Uh, uh, I would say yes. So typically the way that if we if we win a new deal where the found that chain foundation is working with us, it's usually successful. If we win a new deal from a customer who says that, oh, I really wish that you could support such and such a chain, those are usually the ones that die. 
because they have like 10 relays. And the way that I look at these is um, a lot of them end up being loss leaders and they chains and having chains in your gateway is a marketing spend. It's really that simple. And here's, this is another thing that like, you look at marketing, everybody knows that like 50% of your marketing budget is being wasted, but which 50% is it? And that's, that's what we continue to do. It's an art. There, there's no science here. Yeah, I think the other consideration with like the, 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 the broader like pocket setup is right now, like if you're funding those chains, um, and uh, like you're you're paying node runners in, in pocket, uh, they're likely going to be selling that pocket to fund the nodes that they're running for these little chains, which also adds to sell pressure in the market. Um, so I, I think those those bets are like you know maybe bigger bets than we we think. One from a financial perspective, I don't think. On the in the short term horizon, some of the bets that we've made have been worthwhile. If we need to bootstrap a chain and we don't have a deal in place with a foundation or an entity that is going to pay for that, um, right? ZK Sync and OpBNB are two of the more recent ones where we were paying four grand a month or a few months to maintain those nodes, and we definitely did not recuperate the costs of that. Um, and we had to shut it down and go back to those customers. And every one of them understood it because it was, you know, a handful that had um, requested it. But then from a sentiment point of view, the smaller chains, the ones that are less resource intensive to run. And I think that's something that should, you should be very well aware of, not just how many transactions are, um, are going through a chain, but like how difficult is it to spin this up and how much is it going to cost you? Um, those those have been fine and we've been able to keep those alive with quality of service relays and by going back and talking to our existing customer base telling them we've began supporting x or y or z chain and from a sentiment perspective it has paid back dividends many times now um i think something that is coming up here that we're not really talking about um is if a gateway decide like right so you guys porters decided to launch tyco um but we didn't have any interest from our customers but one thing that is interesting that should be thought about is if there is one of these gateways is coming up and saying, hey, we have interest coming from us for a specific chain, we should probably share that knowledge around to see if we can all go back to our specific customers or marketing channels and start finding out if organic interest can be sourced from other gateways. So the, the ability for a specific chain to kind of break out of the cold start problem organically can happen um, so that you aren't having to foot the cost to run that chain for too many months. Um, and that your existing clientele, your existing one customer isn't completely um, dependent on them driving all the demand because Pocket Network wins, wins with aggregated decentralized demand. And I think now that we have more gateways, we should all be communicating more aptly around which new chains we all want to launch or if you have customers that can drive more traffic. So as an example, um, we stopped serving Moonbeam and Moonriver because we couldn't guarantee quality of service with the SLA we have at our gateway level. But I believe others are still servicing Moonbeam and Moonriver. So I think those chains are still alive. I, I'm not on a computer right now, so I can't look at pocket scan. Um, but if the aggregate collection of six gateways can all come and say, hey, we have a few dozen customers collectively that can do, you know, 3 million, 1.5 to 5 million relays uh, per day, then we can open up our gateway as well and definitely help make sure that the life, uh, the, the uh, life expectancy of a chain is extended. So this is something we should think about as a community on how to move forward with this. Yeah, I, I like that contract a lot. The, the other, um, something that came up that's really recently, uh, actually earlier today, uh, uh, call I was on is, um, like the, the idea that like, maybe it's those, you know, maybe node runners get paid in whatever the token is of that chain. Um, because part of the problem right now, uh, that, that Fred pointed out is, is really the risk is all on the pocket, right? Um, like because you're you're paying like whoever's doing it, you're, you're paying node runners in, in pocket, 
and that also creates sell pressure, which makes it harder to, you know, to to move the price up because there's real costs. But if you had like, you know, ABC, New Chain, whatever, uh, you know, they maybe pay for the relays, whatever the token is, and because of the relationships with the runners and everything, you might find no runners willing to to make that bet where you 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 move the the risk off of pocket uh, for those that think you know they're willing to to take the risk does that make sense um we've definitely done token swap deals in the past uh or where we get paid in the native tokens and um it's <laughs> it hasn't gone well how's that for a short answer have, have you used that token to pay node runners so that you're spreading the risk, or have you just assumed all of the risk in that deal? Uh, we have almost always assumed all the risk in the deal. And typically when we bootstrap, though, we're offloading risk because we pay in cash. Like the sell pressure is not, yeah, I mean, the sell pressure is not on the pocket token for the bootstrapping phase. Yeah, 100% we pay in USDC or cash straight up to any RFP winner or any node runner we approach directly. Yeah, so the, the idea that um, came up uh, earlier today that I thought was interesting, I, I, I hadn't really um, thought about it, was the idea that like maybe rather than paying in USD to the, the node runners, uh, you say, hey, like we've got this deal with you know XYZ chain that's willing to give us you know, why of their tokens, which might be worth zero, um, but could be <laughs> worth a lot more. Uh, anybody, you know, anybody in on that that deal. Um, so, so again, like using like an investor strategy rather than having like one investor, you have a, a pool of investors that that uh, spread the risk out. You want to talk about a real chicken and egg? Is exactly what Breezy just said. It's that. You can't pay for hardware with Dogecoin today. And there's just not enough payment rails to use the native tokens to pay for the hardware. At the end of the day, if you're buying a CPU, they want greenbacks or, you know, whatever. They want euros, rubles, whatever it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, but there might be uh, node runners that have extra capacity uh, that, that could do that. Um, and, um, it, you know, it, it's definitely a risk reward. It's just a question of like, Who's taking all the risks? Is it you know the Pocket Network Foundation? Is it Grove? Is it individual node runners? It sounds like right now it's it's not really the tokens, and and that might be a, a big part of the challenge. So we have orchestrated most of it. Okay, so we, as Fred said, we've had some lemon deals. I'm dealing with one right now, um, where. We, we okay, so let, let me just jump to the point. We try to get to the point where we don't agree, accept any new D, new chain deal in a took in that um chain's native token, um, because it is just it's guaranteed to plummet by the time we get paid, and we then have to deal with nuances of how we get paid. And we've had a couple contracts, a couple folks who have skirted the deals of their contracts, and we've had to shut down those chains and have to go back to our customers and say, no, we're not supporting this. Um, and because the traffic they were going to send was going to be minimum, a minimal, so it wasn't going to support the chain. Like, I, I, I'll give you, yeah, I'm not going to go through the specifics, sorry, of the contract I'm currently dealing with. But I prefer, personally, as a gateway, because we initially take on all the risk of, of cementing a deal, a, a, a telling our customers something is coming, um, and then paying the node runners uh, a chunk of change to bootstrap this. If we take payment and tokens, it almost always certainly fails on the time horizon in which we need that those funds to not fail. Um, so I, I am not personally, and again, Steve, I'm just not a fan of this right now based on the experience of the last couple of years. So it's kind of the same thing, though, isn't it, right? Like, you're going to have some percentage of those chains fail, and um, uh, like maybe the timeline is different, but... Uh, those, those ones that fail are likely going to fail, whether it's their token or or something else. It it still comes back to just like, like managing the risk. Like if, if you don't know for sure which ones are going to succeed, which ones are going to fail, which obviously you don't. Like nobody does. 
there's 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 going to be um, there's got to be some way of like managing that risk, and, and and it could be like a lot of understanding about you know probably I'm, I'm afraid it's part more than any of us like uh, just knowing how to pick them right like a, a good investor might uh, and 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 once you see some patterns you can say all right like we have enough confidence that you know uh, of, of, of 100 picks this is how many are going to make us this much and we can keep doing that and you know maybe uh, cash flow is something that needs to be considered but you have enough confidence that you're going to get a return over some time horizon but i think um but sorry i'm not just renting to get to the last part of this I, I, I know the way to manage that risk would be to see if anybody else would be interested in, in, in taking part of the bet. And at the end of the day, the costs, uh, I, I think, are going to hit the node runners. And if you could, you know, pay them in another token, you know, they could liquidate that token without that creating downward pressure on uh, like pocket, which is kind of my root interest in that whole idea. Sure. I, I think for us, the best deals that we have had are the ones where, like Radix is probably the best deal that we've had, where they pay us a fixed amount to onboard the chain. And they pay that for 12 months straight, irrespective of how much traffic they have. And we build enough of a margin in there um, in which they um, get the SLA back quality of service but we still make enough money and we pay enough to the node runner who's providing us the bootstrap Radix nodes and no token, no pocket is not affected at all in any way. And those deals are a little more difficult to come by sometimes. And to be fair, where Grove is today, like right this moment, we're not in a position where we want to be bootstrapping a bunch of new chains. I will tell you that I've had a lot of conversations, uh, especially when I was in Brussels with, uh, rollups as a service providers um, like Third Web, Gelato, and Conduit, and there is a market here where we could basically start, you know, spinning up new chains, you know, every other day if we wanted to. But I don't know if we'll be able to make the types of that type of money that we would we are able to make on deals like Radix and others, where we make a fat margin on it and it doesn't affect our token and our node runners are happy, even if there's zero traffic, organic traffic going through that chain. Um, but I, I think that the de-risking de -risk, de portion needs to happen with the gateway because the gateway is who's going to be making the deals. And even in post the post Shannon world, I know there's no decision really being made about how permissionless the chains will be. There's still going to be an upfront cost to launching the chain and an upfront cost to bootstrapping the chain. So most likely gateways are going to have a business model in which bootstrapping new chains will help their bottom line uh, because they have the relationships with the various node runners. Yeah, I, I think that's the part that's most interesting is is the um, like the gateways or uh, just pocket in general it could kind of benefit from being the matchmaker of, of sorts. But what's challenging now is in addition to being the matchmaker, you're also a financier of, of this stuff. And that like that that that's the part that's probably, you know, most you know, most of the risk. But if you could sort of crowdfund for lack of a better you know uh, analogy uh, the the trapping the of these new chains um and the, the logic in in my head is like right now um you know pocket has a lot of extra capacity you know so so it's it's over provisioned and that would kind of suggest that the node runners underneath that also have extra capacity and if they're going to pay for it, no matter what, um, maybe making a bet on some of these new chains is uh, like is is a bet they're willing to make if their costs are like incremental or, or non-existent. Um, I know that's not always going to be the case, but in some cases it may. Yeah, yeah, we can continue thinking through this. Um, I do. I think there's a thought experiment here. We don't need to think about it today. Uh, we don't need to talk about it today. I just want to plant the idea. Uh, so I'm, and I, I think Mike and Fred have heard this a million times, but I'm someone who personally likes to think about boundary conditions or like edge case problems. Um, and like there's two edge cases here I think we should think through is a, a world where we launch no more new chains 
and we kind of live with where we are now um, and what that does to our network. In a world where we prepare ourselves or have this auction style set up or have a crowdsource set up where we launch a thousand new chains very quickly and see what that does to our network and what that does to demand, assuming all the gateways are on board. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting experiment to think through. I don't want to take up the time now, but I kind of want to plant the seed in the head because if we can come up to a solution on how to potentially like really grow the number of services we support here uh, really quickly and we can figure out the economics there, then I think that's something that the gateways can all adopt and start applying and we could actually get to that type of world. Um, and I think that's kind of where, Steve, the answer you want probably resides on that half of the equation of like, what, what does the world look like if we kind of don't work in this weird middle ground where sometimes a girl will launch three or four chains in a month and sometimes they'll launch, you know, uh, one chain in four months. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I just wanted to plant that seed because I kind of want others to kind of think through that. Yeah, I, I'll echo what Art says, but I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of levers to work with here. Um, some of them being parameters, some of them being, you know, tokenomics proper. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of different things and ways to think about this. The hardest part is overcoming the cold start problem and then ensuring that the bottom doesn't fall out along the way. Like at some point, if relays go down, chains can just die. Um, you know, we've seen test nets and things just go belly up and our customers call us the next day like, what happened? And we go on pocket scan and we see there's just no, there's no note staked anymore. So I, I can't do anything about that. So um, that's, those are the things that uh, need a lot of thought. Yeah, on a positive, like we're, we're to the point where you can say what you just said is like, now we know what the hard parts are. Um, so. I think that's uh, I think that's good. Doesn't mean that there's an answer, but at least you know where to focus. Yeah, and and like I extended this to uh, the Porter's team, but if anyone has questions or anything about like the new chains, I am more than happy to be fully transparent and share experiences. So if you want, you know, some consulting, I guess I'm I'm here for you. Just ping me, and, and we can talk it over. Okay. When Thanks. when it comes to new chains, um, I mean, I, I I think things will change a lot when other communities can join, right? So, say a new uh, a new chain is launching on uh, uh, you know a, a new chain is launching. There's likely going to be some kind of validator community, node running community, uh, you know, part uh, a part of that um, chain, right? Uh, and ideally, you know, Pocket could be the easiest onboard to, hey, if you're already running this chain uh, and your new favorite chain is launching, um, then you can just join. And then it's not this chicken of the egg or uh, chicken before the egg, you know, kind of uh, situation where you have to try to get existing node runners that are already running all these other chains to then run a node um, of a new chain. Um, because really there's just more opportunity for existing, uh, communities to join. So ultimately, I mean, that's, and, and that's what pocket originally, the, the original vision of pocket was, um, it wasn't, you know, that we'd have this kind of closed community of node runners that have to support every single chain ever launched. Um, it was definitely the ability to onboard new, uh, have new people join because they want to monetize their existing node. So I think with a lot of these new chains, um, when Gandalf is down to one uh, and minimum stake is reduced, uh, you know, there could be a real opportunity where the value proposition is, hey, you know, put a few hundred bucks down uh, to get a node and then you serve RPC. And if you're already running a validator or whatever for this new chain, then uh, 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 you know, then you're essentially double dipping while also having the benefit of holding pocket. And then if that chain starts to really pick up, right, uh, in traffic, uh, that's where more node runners will then from, you know, from the pocket community would likely join in because they can 
uh, there's there's not relays there, right? And so there's an incentive for more people to join as the relays go up. So, you know, these validators maybe that are double dipping on RPC and validation. Uh, yeah, you know, they're a real way to get things bootstrapped. And I don't think, you know, they'll really be overwhelmed uh, from their validator duties uh, because I think once, you know, traffic starts to pick up, there's going to be a real incentive for people to jump over to start serving uh, from the pocket community serving this, you know, new chain. Um, so that can be a way to allow gateways um, to partner with these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, new chains um, because, yeah, th that could be literally almost a free way to get initial infrastructure if that community is willing to participate as well. Yeah, I'll just reiterate what I put in the chat. Like, <clears throat> it is a very strong and compelling uh, sales pitch for why Pocket to have yeah. infinity chains and services and like have them all. Um, it, it has many a time gotten us to a point where we have won deals over other, by all quantifiable metrics, better <laughs> providers, just because we have such a breadth of services. So um, I definitely want to continue to lean in on having infinity services. It's just, you know, for the time expensive. being, uh, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, which is why I went to that, like, that position last week. And I'm not going to maintain that position. I'll just reiterate it for the sake of this conversation. Is it would be nice if a benevolent organization sitting in the middle would fund infinity chains for a period of time, um, allowing the various gateways, when they all feel comfortable, to start shooting as much traffic or marketing as much traffic to support those chains. And then over a period of time, kill the ones that, you know, the ones that failed, you know, the whole Darwin, the Darwin uh, mechanism. So um, my, um, my, my thoughts here are where we currently are in the life cycle of Pocket is we have heard from quite a few providers um, that we tend to be the node running we tend to be the RPC provider of last resort where they just need a transaction to go through and they don't care for what the latency is. Um, that isn't always the case, but that is a case we have heard more often than not that we will be swapped in if another provider's uh, infrastructure goes down or their latency goes down below a certain threshold, but ours is still fine, where they will just send us the traffic, which is why to answer the question that has popped up for a long time in the den, which is like, hey, you've signed all these contracts. Like, where are all the relays? The contracts are all there. The relays come in, but they trickle in because we don't always have the best um, quality of service for the long tail of chains, which is where a lot of these providers would like to send us requests. It's gotten better. Like recently, Trust Wallet up their up their commitment from like one or two million a day to over twenty. Um, and that is across many chains, and we just had a call with them this week, and we're hoping to get more on top of us changing our pricing. So I guess what I guess I forgot what my, the whole point of what I'm trying to say here is now, but um, uh, there is a huge argument for Pocket in its current state and how we are currently perceived to have a massive breadth of chains. It is just very expensive for Grove to be able to fund them on their own in perpetuity. So we do make bets, but these bets usually come with decent margins. So we are able to cover ourselves. So, so it's really a financing thing, right? Like you said earlier, like it would be nice if there was a benevolent middle group that would fund all of this. But the what I'm hearing is um, like somehow we need to figure out how to uh, like fund the, the bootstrapping all these chains because that's the real opportunity um but the the, the it, it's really just about risk like if you could spread that risk out or or find somebody that doesn't care about the risk uh that seems like the the really broad answer how you spread the risk out is a, a completely different question but uh is is that what I'm? Am I understanding that? Right? Or kind of, kind of. Like I, again, this is this is Arthur's personal take, right? This doesn't, you know, um, irrespective of where I sit inside this ecosystem, I have my own personal opinions because I've been on a lot of these sales calls, and I've been here for long enough to be able to form them. Um, 
if if our goal is if the initial goal not if the way pocket has evolved is growing a diverse decentralized supply side that can scale to handle as many requests as possible coupled with the last two to three years basically shaking out the node runners who aren't able to find a way to become profitable so we have the really grizzled veterans here the goal now which is the whole pivot for Grove last year with the rebrand and this year with you know how we're moving forward is to drive decentralized demand. And the idea is I feel personally that yes, some organization should take on the risk of bootstrapping this entire um, this initiative with the help of these gateways, right? So if 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 Steve, you were to come to me and be like, hey, here's a million dollars this quarter launch as many chains as you can, dry, you know, spend some time getting as much customers as you can. I know exactly what we would go off and do right now. And we could get a bunch of chains up and running, but that is a huge risk to take. And there's zero guarantee that this bet will play out in that three month time horizon, but it might play out in the long time horizon because we will have had a set a, a, a narrative for ourselves that we are able to support, or rather double down the narrative, we're able to support the long tail chains, may be able to win more customers, may have them send us double, triple, quadruple, 10x the traffic that they do, and then kind of do what some customers have been doing with us lately and saying, hey, we love your service. We'd like to launch new chain X. Can you just launch it for us? We'll set up a three-way conversation with the, their foundation so you guys can work out a deal and we can go that way. Like, I feel like that is something we've never really done. It's just been on growth to figure this out. Um, yeah. And, that, and I, yeah, that's one way to think about it. And yeah. I'm not saying we need a million dollars or just throw a random number okay. out there. I think I completely get it. I, 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 the, the, the part that uh, I, I think I'm just thinking about differently is it, it doesn't need to be one, one organization that steps up and says, hey, I'll give you a million dollars and fund it. The real problem is just funding generally. Right. So it, it, it could be, uh, for example, um, like a group of node runners saying, you know, I'll take a slice of that bet. Uh, hypothetically, right. It, it, it's just a funding. It, it's not that we're missing one big benevolent person willing to step in. It's just that we haven't figured out how to fund it. And, and well, I, yes. And to add to what you just said, all of this has also really come out through the bear market, right? Like, we have basically built in the last two, three years, we have built this you know, enterprise grade portal um, that can handle all these, the, these requests. And in that time frame, our token hasn't done well. So we've had to have capital injections from outside to figure this out. Um, and we've had to take a lot of, we've made a, you know, a, we've had to experiment. And like any startup, we've made our own mistakes and we've figured those out. Um, but, yeah, if our token were to perform more normally, we could easily cash some of that out to fund this experiment. And this goes for everyone involved. But right now, yeah, it would be nice to have a spread, you know, a bunch of folks take the risk, spread it out, and um, allow for us to kind of pursue this initiative to gin up more demand because we have an idea of how to do it. And this would also enable all the gateways to work in concert at the same time to do that. If all the gateways knew for certain going to Porter's questions, like, how can you guarantee that a certain chain is going to be available? Well, if someone is taking the risk to provide the funds and the gateways have set up deals with node runners to provide it, and all the gateways are aware of these deals, and therefore they can go off and start selling. Um, yeah. traffic. That coupled with, obviously, the Path SDK um, being made aware, uh, available to everyone, which I guarantee to you the team is working as hard as possible to get out the door to you all. Yeah, the, 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 the challenge I think that you're going to have with that, whether it's PNF or, or any organization, is um, the 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 upside is not aligned with with everybody else because what will happen uh, is, is is basically um, what's happening right now in in my opinion is like every single new chain has a cost element that is tied to it right and so every single node runner has real USD costs I, I don't know who posted that in the chat but somebody said it earlier but like yeah it's it's like you're not going to go pay, you know, whoever your infrastructure choice is with ABC token. Like it's 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 USD. Um, so naturally, as soon as they get rewards, they're going to have to sell those to pay for for infrastructure. Which which means it's it's more than just 
Groves risk, uh, like with the, the node runners, uh, like it's those node runners are going to take the, the rewards that they get and they're going to sell them, which is going to hold the price down. So it hurts everybody uh, in, in, in that sense, um, because the value of this stuff goes way up if the price of the token goes up, but the token price can't go up with like uh, downward pressure that's not creating enough volume to like change anything so maybe like the node runners would be open to you know hey like i've already got capacity for some of these uh i don't need to get paid in in uh you know uh, pocket rewards um i can get paid in you know whatever rewards uh, the token i don't know I'm, I'm i'm just like thinking out loud here but uh sure sure i understand so rather than having like the inflation right rather than node runners getting uh the rewards immediately uh, while we do this. There is some other way to pay them for the real costs while these chains don't actually mint anything, which uh, kind well, of antithetical to how this works, but it's like, I understand what you're thinking about, how you're explaining it now. Yeah, because they could get paid even if the token never pays off. Um, and, and, and the way that that works is like, if that downward sell pressure doesn't affect the pocket, price and they're still in the pocket ecosystem the value of pocket could go up even if that long tail chain tanks so you're hedging your 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 bet uh as a node rubber where um you could like see crazy returns from this token that nobody's ever heard of before um and, and you could get paid off big time there um but but you could also see returns just as a result of the the value of pocket going up because we're not creating as much inflation and, and downward sell pressure so it, it it seems to me that like you know a, a, a node runner might at least want to consider this as part of their like hedge and financial strategy as they're trying to build their business where if you just had like pocket network foundation funded it doesn't change their interests or look at it at all. It just keeps out. And and and, and that probably isn't going to work. Okay. I, I didn't realize what time it was. I do want to continue this conversation with you, but I don't think we need to hold everyone hostage to it <laughs> right now. Um, but yeah, let's continue well, this time. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Well, quick question here. Um, so, Steve, what you refer, or what, what you're proposing, is that off-chain transactions? Uh, I, I don't have the, I, I don't have like the, the detail, literally this, this was sort of a, like a thought that came up in, in the last couple of days. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have any specifics around it, but, but it's more theoretically like, like right now, if, if for every transaction for any chain, you're getting paid, like no are getting paid for in pocket, regardless of how well that chains performing the costs are going to be on the network and the it, the the likely reality is that um node runners are going to need to sell that pocket to pay for infrastructure or even just to realize uh like uh, profits and, and that that is going to hold it make it harder for the price to go up but if you could this conversation is is uh, it seems like there's a long way to go in it and we are like 10 past the hour at this point yeah, and yeah, benedictus yeah. has also mentioned uh, and sloppy joe has also mentioned that that they would like to continue um i would propose that there are a couple of options here to continue the conversation in a productive fashion one is as always start a thread on the forum because those thoughts are collected there and kept there in, in long form and allow other people to engage with them over time i highly highly recommend that um but two um we had a scheduled like a uh, um builders call or slash office ecosystem call that i don't think is currently being uh, uh administered but if people want to plan to regroup in this channel and and outside of the recording and continue the conversation on i mean that's what these channels are for so you are certainly welcome to come back here but i think for the purpose of ending this video and our recording in a reasonable time we should probably cut it here and and move forward outside of this agreed no more open forums <laughs> all right jinx
I just want to jump in before we uh, end it. Kane um, and everyone still listening, as we're going to be triggering Yandel next week, uh, I just want to call out that we really need to make sure that suppliers have reallocated uh, their chain stakes and existing gateway cap. Uh, because like Fred and I mentioned last week, after looking through pocket core, a law will break um, if, you know, the major gateways and the major suppliers don't properly properly reallocate prior to the governance transaction. So please uh, keep sending as many updates to the entire community as possible. Very important call out. Beautiful. Thanks, y'all. Thank we will see you again uh, same time same channel next week and uh, i look forward to seeing the continuation of this existing conversation in our other uh, uh, other venues <laughs>